Okay, Sydney. So it's really great to have you on for the inaugural podcast. It's very fitting since you wrote the inaugural story for the website Washington Babylon. And yes, I just wanted to ask you. Thanks for having me. Oh, God, it is truly a pleasure. It really is. I mean, it's, we have such a strange, wonderful relationship. Um, anyway, so I wanted to ask you to almost introduce yourself because I think a lot of people know you, and this is the way I knew you initially, as the woman who brought down Wiener, as in Anthony Wiener, which you performed such a wonderful public service for the whole country in doing that, <laughs> but it was also a little bit traumatic for you. And you're way more interesting and complicated than that. I have to say you are one of the best writers I have ever worked with. I'm not lying. I would never say oh, that if it wasn't true. Oh, that's so nice. Thank you. It's, it's true. I mean, it's amazing. You turn in copy that I barely have to touch, and you know it because you see the before and after, and the after is almost the same as the before. So it's really a pleasure to work with you, and you're way more interesting and complicated than a lot of dumb people think you are. So why don't you tell us a little bit about you? So I think I'm actually pretty boring. You know, people know me for the scandal stuff, but I like prefer to stay at home with my cats. <laughs> I'm like a total homebody, really introverted. I think people kind of expect that I'm going to be this dumb, obnoxious bimbo. And then when they meet me, they're very pleasantly surprised that I'm, I don't know, kind of normal. I guess. I've just had mm-hmm. a very colorful last couple of years (laughs) so what happened because I do want to talk just briefly about one of our most hated media institutions BuzzFeed which what they did to you is indicative of just how sleazy they are in general but like how did you become famous to the public because I know that wasn't your intention Right. It was not at all my intention. And anyone that knows the backstory gets that. Yeah, I had tried to leak information anonymously, really stressed that I didn't want to be any part of the story whatsoever. And then uh, BuzzFeed actually decided to out me, which is interesting because, you know, they chose not to out other sexting partners of his. So I'm not really sure why I got to be their target. But and it was a, kind of a slow summer for news, so the story kind of blew up more than anybody really thought it would. So, yeah, it was just kind of an unfortunate situation. And, you know, I didn't know up until pretty recently that, you know, Wiener's campaign actually gave my identity to BuzzFeed to leak. So for a long time I thought BuzzFeed was actually doing some real journalism and, like, dug up my identity, but they were actually just handed it on a silver platter by Wiener's campaign. Oh, my God. That's Typical. I didn't know that until now. That's amazing. But nothing yeah. surprises me about BuzzFeed. They're about as low as you can sink. Ben Smith is so appalling. I mean, like, how much lower can you sink in journalism than being well, the... Well, what's funny, too, is... Is... Go ahead. It really bothers me because everybody thinks they're, like, innocent animal listicles, but, you know, I'm not the only person that they have kind of gone after in a really unprofessional and kind of sleazy way. I didn't even know that they were going to out me. I just like got a link to the article and it was already up. You know, I didn't really get much of a fair warning though. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me somehow. I mean, their modus operandi is to pose as crusading journalists trying to, you know, present, you know, when they're not doing cat listicles, they're presenting to the public Um, information that the media uh, elite is withholding, which is just complete garbage. I mean, what they like to do and what they did to you, and they've done in multiple cases, and Melissa, uh, who is on the line, maybe she can talk about this at some point, wrote a story today about BuzzFeed uh, and how they leaked this list of uh, shitty men in media. And frankly, I don't care about shitty men in media being outed, but what BuzzFeed does, this is their specialty. They, it's like what they did with the uh, Trump dossier. They get information that has not been vetted. Nobody knows if it's true. So in the case, and I really, you know, if Melissa wants to talk about it, that would be great. In this case of this spreadsheet, this anonymously sourced spreadsheet about shitty men in media, which I wasn't on because I'm not a shitty man, and most of the people on it aren't shitty men either, and so they got screwed. But there was a spreadsheet that they obtained – And it said these are all these shitty men in media, 
and, you know, anonymously sourced and making unsourced allegations against them. And, you know, they didn't vet it. They just presented like, oh, we're just, you know, we're not doing anything wrong. We're just putting this information out there, which we obtained, which is bullshit. Somebody no doubt leaked it to them because they're incapable of reporting. Actually, that's not true. There are a couple of people at BuzzFeed who, God rest their soul when they die, you know, are actually that's not exactly reporting. That's not exactly what happened. Sorry. Oh, well, go ahead. What? Hey, what? it's me, it's... Melissa. Yes. So what happened? So, uh, so the female journalist at BuzzFeed got the, I mean, there wasn't investigative journalism there either. Like, she just got the, the email mm-hmm. um, sent to her as, I guess, a woman. Right. Right. Sorry. No, somebody leaked so. it to them. It's, and then it's just like the Trump dossier, which I am not a fan of Donald Trump at all. I detest him and Hillary Clinton. But BuzzFeed gets a dossier that is raw intelligence and puts it out without vetting it. And all of these stories are about Trump. I, you know, maybe half of them are true. Maybe 80% of them are true. But that's really not a good ratio. Hey, we're BuzzFeed, 80% accurate, which is being generous to BuzzFeed. You have to vet information. You just don't put out bullshit. Or if you put out bullshit, at least, like I do, say this might be bullshit, as in the story about Edward Snowden that I published today. He might have been played by the Russians. He might have been honeypotted by an attractive female. But I acknowledge repeatedly I'm not sure about that, but it is based on a year of reporting, so it's pretty responsible. It's not just some unsourced bullshit document. So nothing BuzzFeed does surprises me. I mean, you know, you really can't sink lower in journalism or in life than being the butt boy for Eli Lake. That is Ben Smith. BuzzFeed Ben. My favorite part of my whole dealing with BuzzFeed is that even after they outed me, they repeatedly tried to get me to do different gigs for them. The first time they asked me to be in one of their stupid little videos, they wanted to do a video about what love means to somebody who does porn, which in and of itself is very condescending, as if somebody who is a this couldn't ever mm. possibly really, you know, as if love is any different for a porn star than it is for an average person, and it's obviously not. Right. So that really annoyed me. And then the next time they wanted me to write an article about why I didn't want to vote for Hillary Clinton, <laughs> which was also amusing. It's like, you know, the main reason I didn't want to vote for Hillary Clinton is because BuzzFeed outed me and then kind of made things a little weird for me as far as the Hillary and Hillary situation, you know. So I was like, I don't really think they're going to like what I would have to say if I were to write that article. <laughs> Well, let's, okay, so I'm not going to do this in any particular order, but why don't we talk about that? Because that is actually interesting. And it is the first thing you wrote for Washington Babylon, which I believe, I actually am not entirely positive, but I think it was, uh, no, I'm sorry, August 11th. Yes, it was August 11th, 2016, because on August 12th, the New York Post page six, one of my favorite pages in journalism, wrote about your story for Washington Babylon. So it was a great successful launch in large part due to your great story where you reviewed Wiener, the documentary. But I wanted to ask you, yeah, that was such a great story. I mean, I just loved it. But I wanted to ask you, what, um, how do you feel? Because it's really true. I mean, that was our first story. Um, Well, our second story, technically, because I introduced this story. But It got a lot of play, and actually it did lead to, and some, I mean, I'm not being entirely self-aggrandizing the way journalists always are. I'm being maybe a little bit, but let's just say we changed the shape of history in the election with your story, which is not entirely kind of true. (laughs) It's actually amazingly kind of true, because you wrote a story where you mentioned that Wiener was still sexting young women, in, 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 including an uh, you know, underage woman, and that did lead very directly to uh, you know, this being publicized, the Comey letter, and it may have changed the election. So I wanted to ask you, how do you feel about that? Because you know, we all hate Hillary Clinton. I assume everyone listening to this program, like every good citizen, um, detests Hillary Clinton, but we got Donald Trump. I have some views about this, but I'm going to cede to you. How do you feel about it? Because we sort of helped elect Donald Trump, who's insane and scary. So what do you think about that? 
I have a lot of mixed feelings about it. It's kind of mind-blowing and surreal and bizarre, and it's like every time I think that a chapter is done, something creepier happens, <laughs> and things just keep continuing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think I'm done with all the, like, salacious stuff, and I feel like I get roped back into it. So mm-hmm. I sometimes feel like I'm living in, like, the Twilight Zone or something. <laughs> you know? But, it, you know, on the other hand, there are so many people that are, super conspiratorial and I just have to say like for the millionth time for the record like I didn't uh, you know I didn't vote for Trump I wasn't a Trump supporter I didn't do anything to try to help Trump I had no way of knowing that any of this would blow up in the way that it did as far as you know the emails on the laptop you know I had no way of knowing any of that so you know it's not like I was some kind of Trump mole (laughs) right I don't even think anyone in the Trump campaign was smart enough to pull anything like that off. That's probably true. Well, I think that we actually, I'm, first off, I'm proud of what we did because it was a great story. And, you know, in journalism, you're not supposed to calculate what is going to be the political impact of a story and whether it's right. going to help your friend or foe. You're just supposed to put out true, reliable, interesting information. But beyond that... <laughs> And that's what we did. And let, I mean, we'll talk briefly about, because you are way more interesting than simply writing about Anthony Weiner, and you've been writing for Washington Babylon about other stuff, and I want to talk to you about this great piece you did last week, I believe. I lose track of time, but I think it was last week. We'll get to that about Mitchell Sunderland, a mutual friend of ours, um, better friend of yours, but who got fired by Vice recently for reasons that are quite mm, curious, let's say. But I have to say, I'm really glad Trump won the election. Let me just get that out there. I can't stand Trump. The guy is scary, um, and I disagree with most of his policies. But I feel like this country had to go through. So if we did change history and impact the election and helped elect Trump, then I don't apologize for it. Because I feel that Trump was necessary. The country was going to get stuck with this lunacy either in 2016 or 2020. And we may as well just burn the house down now and go through this craziness with Trump and see what happens. I mean, maybe we go to all-out fascism, in which case I may regret saying this, but the country needed to go through Trump. Hillary Clinton was a monster in her own way. And at least this election signified the end of the Clinton political dynasty. I mean, they're talking about Hillary again and Chelsea, but give me a break. That is not going to happen. Knock on wood. No, I will literally no. knock on wood. No, it's not going to happen. The election, you know, it's the grave of the Clintons, and I'm glad. Um, But beyond that, you know, Hillary Clinton represented, you know, cronyism as usual, business as usual, the continuation. I mean, I hate everybody in politics, so, you know, this is an equal opportunity in this way. But, you know, Obama, this guy gets elected in 2008. He has huge majorities in the House and Senate, and this absolute – disaster, even before he takes office, announces that the two key economic positions are going to be held by Tim Geithner and Larry Summers. So it's like, let's surrender to Wall Street before I even take office, because he was always a phony, but never mind that. Anyway, Hillary, to to me, just represented a continuation of, you know, her dumbass husband's policies when he was president, which uh, Obama continued. And, you know, if she had won the election, everybody would have sat back and relaxed and said, oh, great, the danger passed. Well, guess what? Hillary would have just continued the most atrocious policies in every way. The country is fucked. We are, I mean, we are in some advanced stage of oligarchy that is terribly scary. And Hillary wasn't going to change that. That was her core. That was her base. Nobody else liked her except for Wall Street, Goldman Sachs paying her half a million dollars per speech. So if she had won, people would have sat back and relaxed and things would have gotten worse. Now we just have flagrant craziness with Donald Trump. Well, bring it on. Burn the house down. Let's see what happens. You know, if I'm we a little bit of an anarchist, so it excites me a little. <laughs> What's that? I'm sorry. I'm a little bit of an anarchist, so I find it a little exciting. I think we kind of deserve this right now. I don't think we deserve two terms of Trump, but we deserve a term of this. I think we definitely deserve it. We deserve it. And, and you know, I think if it's good punishment for the media, too. They, they deserve to be miserable for the next hour. <laughs> oh, that's for sure. Since they I did everything in their power to try to elect Hillary, it's just 
pathetic. Um, and I'm writing a lot about that at Hacklist 2017. So I hope people will check that out. But anyway, yeah, I mean, let's, you know, we needed this. And I think if you're sitting in uh, any other part of the world, you're probably going, you know what, U.S., you deserve this. You foisted this on us. If you're sitting in Latin America, how many coups, you know, we talk about, oh, Russian meddling in the election. Well, we meddle. I mean, we overthrow elected governments. We install That's dictators. True. I mean, it's yeah. about time. We, yeah, we got a taste of our own medicine. Well, good. We deserve it. So what about if we talk about, because you're writing stuff that's really amazing, um, that has nothing to do with national politics, that swamp and cesspool that actually, if you think about it too much, you just go crazy. But you recently wrote a piece, and I'm, <laughs> I can't, you know, it's so pleasurable that you wrote it about BuzzFeed, that you continue to fuck BuzzFeed. They are getting back in multiples what they gave to you. I hope you know that, that they are going to pay way worse than what they gave you with their shitty reporting. I you did so. a, <laughs> I, you know, I, like, I don't know. I must be going soft in my old age and becoming a hippie or something, but I started to believe in karma in some weird way. God, cut that. Edit that out. I never want to be <laughs> like that. But <clears throat> somehow I think, you know, Ben Smith is just an evil shitbag. Um, and BuzzFeed is a terrible journalism enterprise in every way. And, they will. I wish they would have gone down instead of Gawker. I would rather see Gawker around and buy BuzzFeed. Hey, I agree. I totally agree with you. But, like, I hope maybe we can revive a little bit of the – like, Gawker did some really good things. I, I love – I used to love Gawker, but, you know – I did, did too, yeah. Know, yeah, it's great, but they wrote that piece. I mean, but you can't recklessly publish stories <laughs> – that like they did about Peter Thiel, who I don't like either, but whatever. Anyway, but what about, can you talk about your amazing recent piece, which does deal with BuzzFeed, um, not as the center of the piece, but it does, BuzzFeed is uh, mentioned in the story, Mitchell Sunderland, this mutual friend of ours, and, um, uh, and Vice. So can you tell us about that? Because that was a big topic on Twitter, and you wrote this amazing story about it for Washington Babylon. Well, it was kind of crazy. You know, I've been friends with Mitchell for several years. He's one of my dearest friends. And I log on to Twitter, and I'm just kind of scrolling through, and all of a sudden all I see are reporters I know totally trashing Mitchell, calling him a misogynist, a sexist, all these things that I don't personally know him to be. So I do a little digging and find out all of this is coming from this BuzzFeed article where they have released private emails between Mitchell and some alt-right guys, Milo. and Basically, Mitchell referred to a woman as a fat feminist and said, please mock this fat feminist. And because Mitchell was writing for Broadly, which is kind of, you know, Vice's, like, feminist women's issues mm -hmm. site, people really were outraged. But, I mean, I just have to say that all of the reporters who were saying – oh, Mitchell's so terrible. I know that there are things in their private email that they wouldn't want leaked. You joke with your friends. You, you know what I mean? Everybody says, no, nope, you're not always going to be politically correct. Everybody says things that may be slightly regrettable mm -hmm. or are meant to be funny. <laughs> slightly regrettable. <laughs> <I love> that. <laughs> things that are meant to be funny but maybe aren't funny to everyone. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, I, I think I, you know, I kind of know Mitchell as like a bitchy gossip queen, and I, I mean that in a loving way. I love that about him. You know, that's like one of the endearing things about him to me because I can appreciate that. I know him. I know how to take that. But to somebody that doesn't know him, they might actually think he's coming from a super hateful, malicious place. It's not really like that. He's just got a different kind of sense of humor is kind of my take on it. So I felt like the whole thing was really blown out of proportion and it just made me sad that everybody was so quick to be like, you know, this man deserves to be unemployed. And, you know, how are we going to do this to everybody? Every time somebody says something stupid, they just should never have a job ever again. You know, I just think that's kind of a ridiculous standard to set. It is. It's a completely ridiculous standard. And like you say, I mean, if our emails were publicly available, it's, you know, it would be a catastrophe for all of us. 
My strategy for dealing with that problem is that I just say everything in public that I write in my emails. So like I <laughs> right, have nothing to hide. <laughs> yeah, you do too. Yeah. So we, we get around that. I mean, if, if I'm hacked by Russia or the CIA, it doesn't really matter. There's nothing in my emails. They won't find anything that I haven't written uh, at Washington Babylon or somewhere else. So I don't really care. Right. But what I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, so it's wonderful. That's that's the way to diffuse this. And like, instead of living in fear about your privacy being invaded, just make your privacy public. I mean, you can't always do that. I mean, thank God our dreams are still private and our private thoughts are still private. That's the only thing we have left. <laughs> For now, I know. Like, will they figure out how to monetize that invasion of privacy as well? Um, but what I love about your piece um, is what you often do you know, you give this sort of counterintuitive look, but not in some, you know, artificial ginned up way. It's you just bring a perspective that's honest and fresh. And so, you know, you have all of these people criticizing Mitchell for some, you know, remark he makes and what he thinks is a private conversation. And, you know, we all make these sorts of remarks. But you also, you know, talk about how, you know, you gave what is really, I think, a really interesting feminist perspective on this matter um and instead of just oh my god he's the most horrible person in the world you brought something fresh to it and original which you always do and that's why i love you writing for us all the time as well not all the time as much as possible though and you are our one and only unique senior contributing writer and i don't know like i, I don't see how we can have an yeah we can't have a number two like i think whatever Anybody else does for Washington and Babylon, you have to be the unique, sole, senior contributing writer because you're unique. So, but a couple of other things. Um, um, so, but you also, in that piece, it was really interesting because, you know, everybody loves to hate Milo, and I'm not very fond of him in a lot of ways. His views are really reprehensible, and he's, you know, I don't even know if he's serious. He's a provocateur. Um, who knows if right? What he I don't says. take him seriously. He doesn't offend me because I, you know, I think he's just being ridiculous for show a lot of the time, you know. And I, if if you're not able to disagree with somebody and still sit there and listen to them, you're an idiot. You know, I, I just that when he was on Bill Maher and everybody was protesting and throwing a yes. fit, just completely insane about it. I just. I didn't really understand that because how boring would it be if we only ever listened to people we fully agreed with? How are you ever going to grow or learn or form any different kind of opinion or, you know, maybe even become more firm in your own opinion by listening to somebody that you disagree with? You know what I mean? It's only a good thing, I feel like. Yeah, of course. I mean, I, I, mean, I would hate to sit around and listen to people repeating back to me what I believed. And, at the website, I really like to, I mean, even though I generally publish stuff that's in rough agreement with what I believe, I mean, I believe things across a wide spectrum of opinion. I don't just have, I don't even know how to define, I mean, I'm, I'm on the left, but I'm sort of an anarchist and libertarian and, you know, I mean, that's I don't about even know where I lie it. at the moment. <laughs> yeah, I don't even, right, right, and that's an interesting place to be. And I have friends, and I'm sure you do too, you know, across the political spectrum from, yeah, even though, of like, course, neocons. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like, it's what makes life interesting. It's how you grow intellectually and as a person. And I sort of hate neocons. They're pretty much the worst people in the world other than flat-out fascists. They're just, like, a step below. But I have a few neocon friends, and some of them are smart. Most of them are not, um, and most of them are tools. <laughs> but I even talked to a few neocons. But I, you know, from paleocons to neocons to typical standard right-wing corporacrats and, you know, left-of-center corporacrats and neoliberals to all the way over to communists. I mean, you know, which I'm sort of sympathetic to, too. I'd love to talk on a future episode of Washington Babylon about my soft spot for Uncle Joe Stalin, but that's not for tonight. But I um, know, hey, uh, Sydney, it's Melissa. Can I... Mm -hmm. can I contribute something to this part of the conversation of a little bit. Um, so I was actually <laughs> somebody that Sydney was kind of preaching to. I jumped on that bandwagon as well. I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe he's talking to him. You know, I can't believe they're sharing these um, emails. But, like, your piece really kind of put it in perspective. And I was like, you know what? This, this, 
That's right. You know, this is bullshit. Well, I appreciate <laughs> you know? that. A big part of my problem so. with it, too, is that, you know, these are the same people on the left that are constantly preaching tolerance. And then the second somebody who, by the way, Mitchell is not all right. You know, <laughs> Mitchell's far from all right. I would consider him mm-hmm. on the left. So the second one of their own says something they don't like, they're just done with them. They're totally intolerant then. You know, there's no forgiveness. There's no redemption. They immediately just want to, like, burn him at the stake. And I just find that a little bit hypocritical. You know, the tolerant left, the second you say something wrong, they're just (laughs) done with you. They're out for your head. You know, you're going to be fired from your job. Yeah. And I like what you said about the private emails, too. I mean, because, yeah. Who ha- you know, who doesn't have a joke every now and then and, you know, God right. forbid, yeah. my emails you, never yeah, got out. Things, <laughs> yeah, you say things with your friends that, you know, maybe you're funny to you guys that would be offensive to somebody else, but you don't mean any harm by it, you know? Right. We're so. venting. It's just a way of venting. Yeah. So it was a, it was a very good piece. I did, I did appreciate it, and it, it did put perspective. I hope other people read it and, you know, kind of got that perspective as well. They should help. So, yeah, I hope you so, that. too. You know, I just felt bad, you know. I know what it's like to have everybody on the Internet kind of ganging up on you, so yeah. it kind of hit a nerve to see the people doing that to somebody that I care about and I know is not a bad person. I just felt like it was really being incorrectly framed, and it just bothered me. Yeah, well, I think you, I, you know, I, we are doing surprisingly well with traffic, and I think that piece – definitely got an audience and you brought a perspective to it that really wasn't seen anywhere else. And one thing I really liked, you you wrote about how you disagree with Milo about just about everything, but he, you said, you know, and I'm just reading from your piece now, pretty much the only thing I've ever liked that Milo has said was this about Mitchell's situation. You can bully people into being politically correct in public, but you can't change how they think in private and they will only grow to hate you if you try. Boy, he really nailed that. I mean, that's yeah, great. Yeah, I know. I know. I was like, I, I hate to agree with the guy. I don't like anything about him, really. You know, but, you know, he really hit the nail on the head there because it's one thing to, you know, force everybody to watch what they say on social media, but people should have the freedom to say what they want in their private emails without being harassed into losing their jobs. Yeah, definitely. I mean, these are scary times. The last thing you want is, you know, to have to police your own thoughts, to be even less original and daring because you're afraid that you're going to lose your job. I mean, everybody's afraid of losing their job now. I mean, you know, the, it's a scary economy for most people. The media doesn't seem to see that for the most part, the elite media, because, you know, they get paid so well. And so that's one of the reasons they completely misread the election and believe that, Hillary was going to win because you know I didn't think Hillary was going to win. I remember telling my dad the day before the election he was very confident that Hillary was going to win, and I I just didn't think it was going to happen. I just felt like having two terms of Obama historically it just made sense that whoever the Republican candidate would be would win. I just didn't think there was any way Hillary would win. But I also live in a red state, so I kind of know these people. I know these voters. So I just was like, there's absolutely no way that she's going to win. Mm, that's interesting because I did think she was going to win. I definitely thought she would win. If I had to bet my entire fortune, I would have bet that Hillary was going to win. But I really I would have bet on Trump, even though I wasn't wanting him to win. I did think he was going to. <laughs> well, but you the were country smarter is than so me. stupid. That's part of why. You know, this is a very stupid country. So. I mean, we elected That's George true. Bush twice, so I, I don't, nothing surprises me at this point. That is very true. I mean, that is very true. Um, I remember sitting, I was in a bar in D.C. watching the election results come in, and, and I was surprised at um, Florida in particular. Um, that was like, hmm, this may not be quite as smooth. I thought it was going to be over by the time, you know, like, it got to the Midwest. She'd win Pennsylvania. Like, she'd win at least, of the four states, she'd win uh, the key states. Like, in our democracy, there are, like, four states that actually matter. And, you know, I have to say, <laughs> we're a dumb country, but these are some of the dumbest places in America. Florida, Pennsylvania, Ohio. There's one more dumbass state that's really significant. I forget. But um, I remember watching the 
I was at the Marx Cafe in D.C., named after Karl Marx, so I have a soft spot for that, too. And I saw that, um, you know, first they were like, oh, yeah, Hillary's going to win. It's going to be close, but she's going to win Florida. And then it gets closer and closer, and then they're like, well, it looks like Hillary's, you know, Trump's going to win Florida. And I must confess, I a little thrill, you know, I got a little <laughs> jolt of energy about that because I was – fundamentally, I guess it'll come as a shock to people just rooting for Trump to win. Yeah, I want, you know, burn the place down. Anyway, Sydney, one more question. And this is sort of, um, let me just lob up a softball or a piñata or however you want to put it. But Harvey Weinstein, or I can never pronounce these Jewish names like my own, but Weinstein or Weinstein, <laughs> I have no idea. Anyway, this Hollywood mogul, uh, Kinseltown, since we're a tabloid, um, is in the news and, like, it's a softball, but at the same time, it's sort of interesting, um, and we've written about this, too. Um, uh, Andrew Stewart, who's not on tonight, at least so far, um, but he wrote an interesting piece about how, you know, everybody, I mean, the New York Times did this big expose about, you know, Weinstein's sexual harassment and worse. Everybody knew about it. You know, the L.A. Times, like, out in Los Angeles, wasn't covering this, but this was basically an open secret. So this was their big expose, but it's like, give me a break. The New York Times knew about it. Everybody in who was covering Hollywood knew about it. Um, but let me just ask you, because I know it's like the most obvious question, but I know you'll bring something original to this conversation. Tell us what you think about this scandal. What's surprising or interesting about it beyond the obvious? I know you'll have something. I'm putting you on the spot here, but I know you'll deliver something. If that will just edit it out. What I love about this scandal is that people think porn is much, much sleazier than any kind of mainstream acting. And I have to say, I've been treated with way more respect on porn sets than what these actresses are describing in their dealings with Harvey Weinstein. So, yeah, it, it's disturbing. I mean, I can go on a porn set to bang some guy, and the director is way more professional and normal and treats me with more dignity than this guy would for these, you know, very highly paid actresses. So I think that's one thing that I find just pretty amusing about the whole thing. Obviously, it's not funny that they went through that, but it is funny that you can go on a porn set and be treated better than you might (laughs) if you're meeting with some Hollywood big wig. God, I mean, that's, I knew it. I knew you would have something really interesting to say. So you, that's perfect. Um, I, well, Sydney, it was great to uh, have you on the debut podcast of Washington Babylon. I sort of feel like, I don't know, Patty Smith must have felt after she recorded Gloria or Because the Night, even though Bruce Springsteen wrote it, so that's <laughs> bad. But I feel like we just completely knocked it out of the ballpark. Or the Pixies, Where Is My Mind, which is our theme song. But I really want to thank you for being on. and. It was Thank you amazing. For having Better. Me. Oh God. Well, we have to have you on many, many more times. And everybody who's listening and everybody who's not listening should read your amazing stories in Washington, Babylon, including your latest, which was October seventh, called "Fuck Buzzfeed" in defense of Mitchell <laughs> Sunderland. It's a great piece. I'm so proud to have published it, and really proud to have published everything you've done for us. And I hope you write hundreds of more articles. Well, I hope so, too, and thank you for giving me a platform to actually say what I want to say. I I tell you all the time, everybody else wants to censor me, and you're the best editor, so thank you. So starting off, Ken, you've just written this amazing and very funny piece about working at The Intercept. Uh, Let's get talking about what it was like for you there. Well, as I say in the story, it's absolutely the worst place I've ever worked. And I worked in some really shitty places. I mean, I would include here going back to, you know, when I was a teenager working as a busboy in a restaurant, 
in the article I was referring to journalism jobs, but I would have to say it's probably the worst place I've ever worked in my life. Dishwasher, busboy. I never. I was too much of a klutz to be a waiter. But going back to high school, I don't think I ever had a job worse than this. I mean, there's some. It's something really in its DNA, and I'll get to. I'll be a little more specific because I know this just sounds like. You know, maybe this guy's just a bitter ex-employee, which I'm really not. I mean, I'm so done with the intercept. I never read it. I don't care about it, other than to mock them from time to time. But, you know, they paid. But they couldn't. The place was a dysfunctional shit show. I couldn't write. Crazy. That was the problem. I spent a year there being paid a ridiculous amount of money, and they couldn't produce anything. And I used to always say, like, idiots. Piero Midiar, you know, people think this guy is smart because he's a billionaire. Piero Midiar, you meet this guy and you're like, zero charisma, zero brain power. He managed to get lucky with eBay. He was in the right place at the right time. He just quit. I mean, it's like, you know, shit rises to the top. That's the story of his life. So, but they used to sit around and talk about, oh, this is way more complicated than it sounds. This is terribly complicated. And I would say, I remember one meeting saying very, very clearly, you know what? It's really not that complicated. Let people write, hire editors, and publish their work. Get out of the way. And you know what? Washington Babylon, we are proving that. It's really not that complicated. Sometimes it's hard. We have not tragically been able to monetize this very well so far. Um, I think we're about to because the product is good the product i don't want to say that because the website is really good and you know we're getting help and you know it's just look i i feel really confident about the future but even you know when it was sort of you know not writing a lot because i had to make money elsewhere and do other work or you know just was like shit discouraged so i wasn't producing uh i still produce more than the intercept probably i produce more than the intercept does now the place is a joke and beyond just being incompetent, there's a malevolence there. I, and I really don't know what it is. I mean, um, you know, everybody there would talk about Scahill, Jeremy Scahill. What a joke. I call him Captain Jerkoff. That's my name for him. And Greenwald. I mean, Mr. Independent, except that he kisses Omidyar's ass because Omidyar has made him no doubt a millionaire. He may have been already. I don't know. But he's clearly, you know, I've been told that his salary with hidden bonuses is in the seven figure range, you know, so he puts up with any amount of shit from Pierre Omidyar. It's really quite appalling. You know, I mean, Omidyar wants regime change in uh, Ukraine or Syria or Venezuela. And one of his butt boy journalists writes something about it. And Glenn Greenwald, every once in a while will protest like we're independent or, you know, a contrary point of view, but you know, everybody there, including Glenn, including Jeremy, including Betsy Reed, Actually, I haven't, I mean, she forced me to, I wanted her to fire me. I hated that place and I wanted unemployment so I could, you know, have a respite and not just be thrown into the, you know, maelstrom of economic crisis. But she forced me to quit. She said, you know, I, I mean, I was leaving. There was no question about that. So she wouldn't fire me. So I quit. <clears throat> she became a very evil person there as well. And, you know, they all sit around bragging about all the, you know, how independent they are and what they're doing is new. You know, nothing in journalism is really actually that new. Having a voice is new. Maybe you have a new voice or maybe you can tell a story better, but it's still journalism. It's like, you know, driving a car or whatever else. It's a very simple skill and publishing is a very simple skill. It gets complicated when ego gets in the way and when you have a bunch of shitheads like Omidyar and Greenwald and, you know, Scahill. Oh my God, what a joke. And then Betsy comes in and does nothing. No one can change the place. It's literally like the Titanic. You're like, a, you know, five minutes from the iceberg and you throw a new captain on. It doesn't matter. You're going to hit the iceberg. They're going to go down. I mean, well, I mean, Omidyar can keep them afloat forever, but it's pretty much of a joke. I mean, I'll acknowledge they periodically will write something good. I don't know because I never don't read it on principle, but somebody, you know, I'll see if it looks like an interesting story on Facebook or something or Twitter um, and it looks like that might be an interesting piece. But given the amount of money they spent, it's preposterous. They produce very little quality journalism. I mean, you know, they tried to create a racket with Matt Taibbi, which I worked for, um, uh, before they pulled the plug before a single, you know, before we even debuted. Um, 
fired the entire staff except me. They fired everybody else a few days before Thanksgiving. I was transferred classy, very classy beer. I was transferred to the intercept and stayed there for a few months and just found it insufferable. I hate the place, clearly. So I'm a little biased, you know? But that's the thing about journalism. You admit your bias, you let the reader know where you stand, and let them figure out if what you're saying is something resembling the truth. I think I come pretty close most of the time. I certainly know I did with The Intercept. First class shit show. Okay, so I'm not sure, sure if you have seen it, but on the internet <clears throat> there are videos that were formulated originally when The Intercept was launching, and were intended as promotional material. Oh, where I never saw those. I probably was supposed to watch them as an employee, but anyway. They are uh, nostalgic tributes to I.F. Stone, and the obvious concluding implication is that The Intercept and First Look Media is supposed to be the logical successor to the I.F. Stone newsletters. What are your thoughts about that? I mean, give me a break. That's a joke. Hold on one second. I got to get out. And I, there may be too much noise in a minute. But so we may have to finish this later. Hold on. Gracias. Hasta luego. Hey, let me see if I can find a quiet place. This could be hard. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> how? Um, let me get off street. But um, it's a major street that I can. Oh, there's a little spot back here. If they don't throw me out, it's a little hotel courtyard. <clears throat> um, okay. How bad is the sound back here? Perfect. It's it excellent. Is? Okay. So let me sit there. It's actually, it's really hot. Let me sit in the shade. So, <clears throat> I mean, the idea that this is, you know, a IF Stone sort of thing is, you know, just a sad, sad joke. That's, you know, they're all delusional. That's the thing that's sad about this place. You know, they sit around imagining that they're doing something brave and courageous. And all they're doing is what, you know, lots of other people are, are, are doing, which is struggling. Well, in their case, they're not struggling because they get paid so much damn money. A lot of us are struggling and barely able to pay bills. I'm a little better off most of the time, I admit, but, you know, the people there get paid a ton of money, produce very little, and, you know, there are far better places um, to get your news than reading The Intercept, like Washington Battle, and I would say for one, naturally, I mean, I'm sorry, I do have to promote our website, Andrew, so... I'm not going to recommend anybody else, but people know there's lots of good stuff out there, you know, and the intercept, again, look at the amount of money. I can't even begin to imagine the millions of dollars they have spent and they produce virtually nothing and very little memorable. I, I confess I don't read it, but you know, I talk to people about it. I'm not that close minded. I don't want to read it because I don't like the place, but you know, I, I barely hear about this place. You know, it does not really create a lot of buzz. And given the money and the staff, you know, and the, I mean, my God, they had this research staff and, you know, but the one thing that I'll tell you that's just really reflective of what, you know, in terms of their independence, I was there in 2015. And so I was at the Christmas party, which was a complete joke. I mean, <clears throat> there was, I mean, the low point, absolute low point, I think. I mean, there was this bullshit, like they were going to go out fucking bowling or some, what are we doing? fucking Amway salesmen and saleswomen, give me a fucking break. So they were going to go bowling. I didn't do that. I don't know how many people went on that sad expedition. But it was a, it was like, you know, some corporate thing. Um, and But the low point was Pierre flew in for this, I don't know, from Hawaii or his 37,000 square foot mansion in Las Vegas or whatever this shit had got rich off of, you know, from his eBay luck. And you have two employees of the Intercept interview Pierre Omidyar. It's a fucking holiday party. And people sat around and listened to that shit. I am proud to say I did not. I was one of three people that went to a back room and just like, I'm not going to sit here, you know, and listen to Pierre. I don't give a shit what he thinks. He's not an interesting man. He's banal. He's boring. He's, you know, he's had his ass kissed because he's rich. And so he's mistaken. You know, he's he convinced himself that people like him because he's smart and charming. I mean, He's had his ass kissed so much he doesn't realize people are sucking up to him for his money. If he had money, no one would want to be around him. He's a boring, you know, uninteresting clown. So, you know, to have two of your employees interview the corporate chief, and what, I mean, what? how would they intercept feel? How would they cover it if fucking Rupert Murdoch was interviewed by two employees at the Fox holiday party? Would they recognize that for the most craven ass kissing imaginable? Yeah, they would, but they don't even see it. 
But that's exactly what the intercept is about. It's not that Omidyar dictates everything, um, but there, everybody defers to the boss. Everybody kisses his ass. And as I said, you know, given the amount of money, they produce very little journalism at period and almost nothing memorable or interesting. So please, we're the most interesting place in journalism. We're the successor to I.F. Stone. Give me a break. I so, mean, it's pathetic. Okay, so uh, let's mm. touch briefly on everybody's favorite emo military industrial complex reporter, Jeremy Scahill, and his <laughs> uh, yeah. fantastic <clears throat> reportage. What is your thoughts? Well, well, Jeremy is, you know, a mediocrity who wrote a terrible book called Blackwater. The only thing Mer Jeremy is good at, the absolute only thing, he, he, can, he sold his book. He knew how to, you know, he, he knew how to promote it. He knew how to sell it online. It was a piece of shit. It's like literally marketing dog shit. But he managed to do it. Hats off Jeremy, Captain Jerkoff. You're a good salesman. That's all he is. The book was a document dump. He's practically literate. He's practically, I mean, he's barely literate. Excuse me. Betsy Reed edited this piece of shit. She told me, like, it was a terrible book herself. I just, you know, hey, that's the scoop of the day. Um, I used to be friends with her. You know, it's a terrible, terrible book. I understand, and I, I actually wrote this, and I've been told this, and I confess I'm not 100% sure because I've never read this stupid book, but I've been told by multiple people that he never called Eric Prince. Um, and that's just like Jeremy. He's got no ball. He, you know, he does this dumbass movie, um, what was it called? Dirty Wars? Yeah. And he, you know, this clown goes to Somalia. Yeah, I don't even know where he went, but I've been told that he travels, you know, like he's this dumbass white boy. There was a hilarious picture of him on Facebook. I'm told he travels with security and that he's like, you know, basically a baby. But <clears throat> there's one hilarious picture I found of him on Facebook years ago. I wish I had saved it. It's him giving you know, the, the like the reverse peace sign with some Somali uh, shake or Yemeni shake. It's just pathetic. It's like, do you realize what a clown you are? So, you know, this guy... And this is the great irony of the Intercept. I mean, it's founded, you know, Glenn is famous because of, um, uh, you know, Snowden. He got a bunch of documents, which he really couldn't interpret um, very well. And so he made repeated mistakes. But, you know, he, you know, he finally was convinced, like, he almost walked away from this story. Um, and, you know, there's supposed to be, you know, NSA experts, national security experts. Jeremy's an expert in private contractors. You know, Laura Poitras has done, oh, my God, I don't even know if she's still affiliated with them. She's another piece of work. My God. I mean, she made a movie. She was making a movie in Iraq. And, you know, look, I thought the Iraq war was absolutely stupid and, you know, has been a total catastrophe. She was making a movie. You can find this on, um, and just, you know, people listening to this, you can just Google this. Um, and she will dispute this, but I've heard this from many people and it's been written about. She was making a movie and there was a, uh, she was filming, uh, what was clearly going to be attack on uh, an attack on U.S. soldiers by uh, ISIS or Iraq. Maybe it was Al Qaeda at the time. I don't remember. And there's something just a little creepy about that, you know. Like she's, I mean, she knew what was going to happen. Clearly, you know. I believe she was actually in the home of somebody she was staying with who was with Al Qaeda or ISIS. And as much as I detest American foreign policy, and I do understand the reaction against it, including, although I find it reprehensible, you know, the use of you know, suicide bombs and blah, blah, blah. But I can not understand it. If you have nothing, you're not, if you don't have jets or tanks, you use, you know, whatever you can use to fight back. And when we did, after all, occupy their country. So you can understand the response as, as hard as it may be to understand some of the tactics. But um, check that out. Laura Poitras' heroic filming of an attack on U.S. soldiers is just a little bit too creepy for me. I don't know. I don't not. I just I would never want to be in that position. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't. I would not. You know what? I I don't know. Maybe I wouldn't alert U.S. troops. I wouldn't film it, though. I tell you that there's no way there's just something gross about it and amoral, which is what the place is all about. Anyway, a true story. I know for a fact um, and it demonstrates my fundamental point here, which is these experts are not experts. I mean, they didn't, when they started, they were working on a story. It was the first big story, and it was a dud. <clears throat> it was about um, how, I think it was the NSA was monitoring uh, 
uh, Arab American leaders. And I got called into work on it because nobody knew what the fuck they were doing. Um, you know, and I did a little, I'm glad just a little bit of work on it, but it turns out, you know, that it really wasn't true. I mean, first up, they weren't even sure what the documents meant. Secondly, it wasn't clear that, I mean, like these Arab American leaders had been screwed for sure, but they had documents that had come from Snowden that didn't, you know, like there were a couple of Arab American leaders. It wasn't clear that it was a widespread phenomenon, A. B, it wasn't even clear that these guys were being monitored. Um, the story was just highly, highly dubious. But the great thing, whatever you think of that story, if anybody cares to read that dud, I mean, it's like, you know, it was the first big piece and it just disappeared. Um, it got criticized and did not get a lot of pickup. Um, but the funny part about it, the sad part about it, was that they had to call in, you know, their contempt for the mainstream press. They had to call in at the last minute Josh Meyer, who is now at Political, I believe. I worked with him at the Los Angeles Times because I've worked all over the place. I've worked at Associated Press, LA Times, you know, to Harper's, to I founded Counterpunch, and then Alexander Silbern came on board, and now Jeffrey St. Clair does a wonderful job with this. Um, I mean, I've been all over the place. But, um, you know, these guys hate the mainstream press, right? Well, but they had to call in Josh Meyer to save their ass, and he found serious mistakes with the piece. It had to be delayed because they were going to move forward with a story that was fundamentally flawed. And that's the irony. They didn't have sources at CIA or, D or um, NSA. They, didn't, they don't have sources. They got handed documents. You know, if you're handed documents and you actually haven't really reported on intelligence issues, you can't process them. It was really sad. It was pathetic. It was quite eye-opening. Um, I was stunned that neither Scahill or, or uh, Greenwald, you know, had decent sources at intelligence agencies, so they have to call in a mainstream reporter, who's you know, typically the mainstream press, ha-ha, is beneath their contempt. I actually have to say, I find the mainstream press overwhelmingly beneath my contempt. But there are great reporters at newspapers that, for the most part, I don't like or admire, you know, including the New York Times, which I just think has become a huge joke. The Washington Post, the LA Times, I mean, you know, to dismiss the entire mainstream press as a piece of shit is pretty sad, because there are good reporters out there, and you have to look for them and find them, but, you know, and I should say Josh and I um, disagree on a lot of stuff, but he does his work. He's a really hard-working reporter, and, you know, he actually has sources. And I frequently disagree with his conclusions, but at least I respect his work ethic. I mean, fuck, Jeremy and uh, Glenn couldn't even do a, their own story. It was pathetic. That's the story of The Intercept. So let's talk briefly about Glenn Greenwald's apparent vision of reality being roughly equivalent <clears throat> to the dark and light side of the Force in Star Wars. Well, I mean, Greenwald, I just find personally reprehensible. I, you know, unfortunately... I frequently see his stories tweeted or on Facebook. Um, I see the headlines and I assume, I, I, I tend to think that I probably will agree with what he says 70% of the time, maybe. The thing is, as I wrote in this Hacklist 2017 entry, where the two I've done so far, will I give a story about all the people who shouldn't be on the Hacklist because they were too insignificant? Um, and just, you know, and it was sort of not exactly scientific. Um, but <clears throat> there must have been 50 people mentioned in that story quickly. Uh, but so far, I've done the New York Times and uh, The Intercept and on Hack was 2017. I'll probably do about eight more, and then we'll publicly ask, uh, you know, which who's the number one hack. So New York Times, I did first. The Intercept is the second one. Um, the problem with Glenn Greenwald, I don't like to call him Glenn because it's suggest an intimacy or familiarity that I do have, which is why I dislike him so intensely, actually, but I don't, you know, he gives me the creeps. The guy is, <clears throat> as I write in the story, you can't trust anything he says, even if he's right, because he doesn't reach any conclusion honestly. He's got a conclusion in mind when he starts writing, and if the facts don't fit the conclusion, the facts get dispensed with, and his conclusion remains the same. I saw this time and time again. He's not a reporter. He's a shrieking op-ed columnist in the lines of a Richard Cohn at the Washington Post or a you know, Tom Shre Friedman is not exactly shrieking, but, you know, the, 
They know what they're going to say. He's just an op-ed columnist. He's not a reporter. Nothing can be trusted. And, you know, he believes that if you have a difference of opinion, then you're either a liar or you're a whore. You know, if, if, if it's not his opinion, it can't be reached honestly. And I, I can honestly say, and anybody who knows me or has read me all these years knows, I mean, I know I sound like, oh, I'm being, you know, oh, like just completely black and white about Greenwald and the Intercept. And probably I am. It's probably about 80 percent true. Um, I would say maybe in their case, 90 or 95, but whatever. There's no, it's not exactly 100% true. Fine, it's my opinion. But I have friends across the political spectrum. You know, I mean, from the paleocons to the neocons, which are my least favorite, I have to say, although I do have a couple of friends, I just don't understand what the hell they're doing. But I know there are a couple of neo, for the most part, you know. I just think they're dishonest and driven by money and they're professional liars. But there are a couple of neocons I know who I think have a little more integrity than that. Just a couple. Um, I don't want to name them here. Maybe some other time. No, I mean, they probably wouldn't like it anyway. But I have friends from the paleocons to the neocons to, you know, neoliberals and liberals and lefties to commies, you know, and anarchists, whatever. I mean... I talk to a wide range of people every day of my life. That's how I spend most of my time. It's a pretty good life, actually, except I don't make any money or certainly not enough. But, you know, I know a lot of interesting people and I talk to them. And we publish sometimes on Washington Babylon things I don't agree with. I'm about to publish something this week I don't agree with, but I respect the guy who has sent me a bunch of information. You know, I'm going to say I don't quite agree with all of this. But I respect this guy's opinion, so I'm going to put it up there anyway. Even on Russia Gate, for the most part, I think it's overblown, and you know the media has fucked that story up big time by allowing, you know, by publishing so much bullshit that is clearly false, and in some cases having to retract it, that it allows Trump, who does have interesting relationships, an interesting relationship with Russia, and I'm working on something about that too. Um, and some of his advisors, like, oh, Michael Flynn, thank you for sending those articles, by the way. I just started to read them, and I'm going to write something. It's really interesting, those pieces from the Providence Journal. Um, but anyway, you know, those people, I have no respect for people who, you know, like you should be, your own beliefs should be challenged every day. You should never assume you're right. You should, and, and you know, if you don't talk to people with different points of view, you just live in that sad, sad bubble and have your own views reinforced, which is the way a lot of the media works. It's pathetic. I mean, I remember going to Venezuela once. I met Hugo Chavez, I'm proud to say, in 2004 when the U.S., you know, was already trying to overthrow his regime and now, you know, seeking to do the same with Maduro. I think there are problems in Venezuela, for sure. I'm not going to be an apologist for the regime. Hugo Chavez, I'm a huge fan of. Maduro, I have some more problems with, but I still... Maduro or the opposition, I'll take Maduro any day of the week. I hope things work out like better than they appear to be headed. But still, the rampant old oligarchy is rampant. That's Chavez's term. But in any case, I went down there <clears throat> in 2004, met Chavez. Um, I was writing for the LA Times then, and I got invited down by, by a PR firm or somebody who was close to Chavez because they knew I was sympathetic because I'd written stuff about him in the past. So the LA Times, this is so ironic. They didn't trust me, so they sent down, and I've lost my train of thought, by the way. You're going to have to take me back to what I was supposed to be talking about. But I went down to Venezuela, and the LA Times didn't trust me, so they sent a babysitter, this woman named Carol Williams, who was the head of the, uh, like, did their Latin America coverage. She was, oh, this, I know what I was going to talk about. She was awful, just god awful. She hated Chavez. You know, so it's like, oh, so my babysitter is somebody who's even more biased than me. So the irony, though, was that it was a recall where the U.S. was, like, throwing money at the opposition. It was a regime change operation that failed. Um, and Chavez won, you know, the, the election, where the people overwhelmingly rejected his recall, and he remained as president. But Carol Williams had flown down there to babysit me, and she and all these other journalists from the New York Times, I don't remember where else, the first night they all were go going out to dinner, and she asked me if I wanted to go, and I said, no way. I went out with Venezuelans. I'm not going to sit around with a bunch of dumbass North American reporters and listen to them recycle their stupid-ass stories and just then write the same damn story they 
always written. They're, they're not even reporting. They're going out with each other. Like, how irresponsible. You go down there, like, to report, and you go out with a group of dumbass reporters. And before we went, they were all sending each other, because I got some of these articles because from Carol. They were sending each other their own stories and reading their own stories. You know, like, give me a break. They, I doubt they talked to any Chavistas. But the irony was that, you know, Carol, because they didn't trust me, got the lead story on the day of the election. Meanwhile, and she wrote that Chavez was going to lose. It was clear he was going to lose. And she'd been to, like, some fucking country club where voting was taking place. I spent the day in the favela, in the shanty town. And I wrote a story, a little story inside, five or 600 words, which is all they deigned to give me, which saved them from looking like idiots, saying, you know what? It looks like Chavez is going to win because the poor people are a majority in this country. And I spent the day with poor people. So whatever else you're reading, like in these shanties, poor people support Chavez. And, you know, like the U.S. and the whole media are talking. Well, I didn't say this, but this was basically the point. Um, it was, I mean, I didn't say the media like, because, I, you know, I didn't say the media is saying this. I just said, you know, poor Venezuelans don't care if Cubans are providing, you know, their Cuban doctors in their country are Cuban teachers. They want doctors for their kids and schools for their kids. They could care less if they're Cubans or from the U.S. or Russians or Chinese or, you know, Colombian or whatever. They just want these basic fundamental rights of education and health care. Anyway, so, you know, that's the danger whether you're on the left or the right or a neoliberal or whatever, if you just listen to your own side and your own people and you stray maybe just a little bit, you know, in some dishonest fashion to get one quote out of 20 uh, from somebody you don't agree with, that's not journalism. That's propaganda. And that's what most of the media does. And we don't do that at Washington Babylon. And even when we're wrong, which we are, no doubt, sometimes, absolutely positively, um, we're not liars. We don't do our work dishonestly. Gotcha. So I'm going to close it up right now, Ken. I definitely want to talk just for a few minutes about my latest story at WashingtonBabylon.com, although there could be something fresh by the time people are listening to this. And it is about Paul Manafort, who, as everyone knows, was indicted this week uh, and is facing charges of laundering money that he allegedly illegally obtained through uh, his lobbying work for Ukraine. Uh, so what I have learned from a couple of my sources, Monty Friesner and Kenneth Rejak, both who are former big time money launderers. Uh, Monty was a one time CIA contractor and a convicted fraudster. And Ken, uh, was a banker, uh, but who helped, uh, drug cartels launder money. But now they're good guys. They are advising banks and uh, law enforcement to help them identify, to perform basically enhanced due diligence on their clients uh, for the banks and on suspected criminals for law enforcement. So they provided me information from a uh, database they use called EDIQ, um, and they use it in their work to advise banks and law enforcement. And what it shows is that Paul Manafort is a pep or a politically exposed person because of his relationship with one Donald John Trump, the president of the United States. And what that means, uh, and this Eddie IQ report, and as well as additional uh, investigative work, classic investigative work by Monty and Ken has, has also substantiated, substantiated this, is that Manafort, you know, he's claiming that he was He's a victim of a witch hunt, which I'm a little bit sympathetic to, actually. He is being targeted because of his relationship with Trump. 
but if he laundered money, he still laundered money and he's still going to do time unless he flips and uh, rats out other people, which one expects he will do. Anyway, what Monty says based on his investigative work and on this database is that uh, Manafort is a politically exposed person and that he was laundering money. This database turns up all sorts of interesting stuff and Monty talked to uh, well-informed associates in Ukraine and Cyprus and he said the guy laundered money in a really stupid way. It's pretty funny because Monty uh, and Ken both will have on at some point, I'm sure, but Monty likes to say it takes a money launderer to catch a money launderer and he used to launder money. He knows all the tricks. He knows how it's done and he said Paul Manafort was laundering money in a really talking with Crank T. Nelson, uh, Twitter ingenue and uh, <laughs> raconteur of all things uh, weird Twitter, uh, who has been embroiled in a bit of a tussle with the powers that be at Twitter today. And uh, just wanted to get a sense of, Crank, what, what you've dealt with and, and why, why what happened to, you, happened to you and what it says about the larger narrative on Twitter. Yeah. Um, hey, so first of all, thank you so much for the uh, the very kind introduction. I actually think of all of my uh, intros that I've had uh, that I've had on you know pods and things. That one was my favorite. Rock on tour is one that has not been used yet, so I like that. Um, as for what's going on with my now defunct Twitter account, um, although I think there are some people at Twitter who are trying to help out, um, but pretty hard it's a pretty hard suspension on my part uh pretty pretty perma um so what happened was uh maybe two days ago i made a tweet where i said i can't wait until november 4th when millions of antifa super soldiers will uh behead all small business owners and white parents in the town square um so uh, Just for the record, yeah. could you could you give a little bit of background on that, uh, yeah. why that tweet so came up? There's a small protest being like held on November fourth for you know remember remember the north fourth no, of November all that good stuff, um, which you know as is the way of kind of that weird you know foaming right wing media mechanism has been you know driven into Antifa is going to do a day of violence. Um, which is hilarious. Like, I'm not a part of Antifa. Uh, you know, despite what the Gateway Pundit might say, I'm not the president of Antifa. Um, <laughs> I'm just a guy. Um, but, uh, you know, it is interesting that they've kind of been able to transform them into not just this thing that shows up where Nazis are, but just that are just people who are going around and beating up, you know, patriots. Uh, Antifa has become the knockout game. Of 2017. Yeah, it's a knockout game. And it's like, I had to fucking strike anywhere at a Nazi rally, at a Nazi dinner party. Like, just that, that's the only place they show up. But they've been able to, you know, kind of twist this narrative into that they are, you know, essentially just like a gang that's going around. They're a terrorist organization that's going around and committing terror and not, you know, reacting to specific, um, you know, white supremacist movements. Uh, there's never been like an Antifa rally independent of white supremacists. Uh, like they don't, they don't get together at a, at a field just to be Antifa. Um, nonetheless, I mean, even if you weren't particularly tapped into what is going on, I think from the context of the tweet, you could realize that it's clearly satirical. I mean, millions of super soldiers, what would that even be? You think like one one hundredth of America has been developed into super soldiers like – for for anti-fascist like these are you know mostly you know kids in their 20s in you know black shirts going down to you know be braver than you know the people breathlessly reporting on them but it, it is kind of a silly thing on the face of it even if you don't understand the context what uh, one of the great parts of that that tweet exchange was the 
when I would see people who were, were clearly armed, you know, by the description, uh, who were often involved in law enforcement or were at least posing to be involved in law enforcement or at least associated mm-hmm. with it in some way, um, mm-hmm. acting as if they needed to prep for this particular event. Oh, yeah, uh, and then all the windows and everything. It's crazy. I mean, and also what was interesting is these, these same people – are just clearly foaming at the mouth, just salivating at the idea of being able to shoot an unarmed, like, 21-year-old anti-fascist in the face. They're all like, they better not come to my house. I got landmines. They're, like, They're not coming to your fucking house. <laughs> you just want to fantasize about being able to shoot a bunch of, like, unarmed fucking, like, kids. Like, you know, whatever. But nonetheless, this joke got into right-wing Twitter um, probably I would imagine through some cynical people being like, I bet we can trigger some right wing people, which I'm all for. Um, but invariably, you know, the next day I woke up and I had, you know, hundreds of notifications from MAGA Twitter being like, hello, FBI, VP Twitter, please like look at this person, you know, he's a terrorist. Um, and then on top of that, and, you know, I've been sent receipts of this happening. You know, the alt-right, who obviously are at least cynical enough to realize that it was a joke, um, you know, uh, it latched onto this and mass-reported. And that's what gets into the, kind of the issue with the Twitter safety mechanism, which, like, you know, got, you know, Rose McGowan suspended two weeks ago when she tried to, like, mm-hmm. speak out about Harvey Weinstein, which is that it's not controlled by human factors and it's built in a way that rewards mob justice. So essentially you're making the job of like, you know, these people easier. So instead of like, you know, a group of online Nazis or assholes having to go and, you know, harass someone offline or send them gas chamber memes or dox them, all you have to do is get a quorum of, you know, these basement dwelling assholes to go in and find a tweet and just mass report it. And then that, you know, the way the system works uh, will result in, in that person getting suspended. The question I wanted to ask you is that uh, around this issue, there was really two groups of people that people thought had gotten you kicked off of Twitter. And one of the things that I, I really wanted to draw attention to is the fact that people were unsure if it was the MAGA Twitter, you know, your sort of alt-right Twitter sphere, or if it was people who were mad about uh, calling out a distasteful oh, joke. Called. Yes, yes. Yeah, I felt a little bit bad about that just because, like, first of all, Bess has a much larger platform than me. She has, she, she has creative control of a national broadcast television show that's on four nights a week, and she has mm-hmm. more followers, and she writes in major media publications. So I felt it was okay. I'm a big believer in it's not okay to really punch down unless someone's, like, particularly brazen. But, you know, Bess made this thing that was you know, pretty dis- intellectually dishonest, I thought. Um, but more importantly, I thought it just wasn't funny, and I took issue with that. <laughs> and she was basically, the point of it was saying that Bernie didn't deserve a platform because he wasn't, like, a true feminist or something. He yeah. shouldn't be allowed a platform. Be a uh, hack. Be an unfunny hack. But don't be, yeah, being an unfunny don't be a double unfunny hack. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, you know, I feel a little bit bad for that. Although, you know, to be completely honest, everything I saw, you know, people saying harassing a woman online, all it really was was mostly people of color and other women telling her that it was really uncool that she platformed George W. Bush. I only brought this up being saying, ha you know, and she knew she was being, here's the thing, she knew she was being edgy. She made many tweets after the fact saying like, ooh, looks like I triggered all the Bernie snowflakes okay you clearly are trying to play this game online and you're seriously you clearly think that you know insulting other people's politics isn't something that's like eminable or something that should get you in trouble it's wor- it's fine to make fun of other people's politics and when they get mad that's funny because you triggered them that's her that's her philosophy but i responded saying hey it's interesting that you you're no platforming bernie but you have no problem platforming george w bush that's pretty much all i said um, yeah. Beyond that, she asked me. She asked me at one point, "What am I doing? Like, why are you doing this? What do you want?" She said, "Why are you doing this? What do you want?" And I just responded with the the Spice Girls lyrics. I'll tell you what I want. What I really, really want. I really <laughs> that was want, brilliant. I want, I want. I want you to stop platforming war criminals. <laughs> and you know, I think that's funny. But it, I mean, more than anything, I'm not calling her any slurs. I'm yeah. not, you know, calling her womanhood into attention. But of course, because that's kind of the way that certain aspects of liberal Twitter work. 
I get a lot of pushback from people saying like, oh, Krang, you harassed a woman off Twitter. Yeah. The I'm, most, I, the I, most very, important very woman involved here is, yeah. I, is I that, is, are saying, not the like, women in Iraq, not the women in, who are refugees in Europe because of the Iraq war. It's yeah, the, no, absolutely not. <laughs> it's Beth Cobb who made a bad joke. Yeah. Oh, God, and you know what else was <laughs> fucking uh, Lauren Duca? Who I, I don't, normally don't have much of a problem with. Like, she's a little bit cornball-y and, like, you know, hill I think whatever. she's overall a force for good in the world. I think, I think she's great. I think the stuff <laughs> that she does on sexual harassment and the things she did with Martin Shkreli and a lot of her reporting. Critical. No problem with Teen Vogue as, a, as a, an outlet. I think Philip Picardi did a lot of really great stuff there, um, especially considering what it was before. But then, of course, Lauren Duca, because they had this weird, like, no one ever cared when, like, Lauren Duca never said anything about, you know, leftist women and women of color getting bullied off. But another rich, white, media-connected, powerful woman gets a little bit of, like, clapback on one of her tweets, and all of a sudden it's all this solidarity and shit. Um, and, like, you know, to a certain degree, although I was 100% in favor of the Internet kind of swelling behind Rose McGowan, uh, when she was unjustly kind of forced off the off Twitter, um, I, I can't help but notice that none of that was afforded to you know people like Leslie Jones or even Linda Sarsour when she constantly is being attacked. Like no one gives a Absolutely. shit about that. Absolutely, it's and, like and these rich white you know media connected women, and they think like that is the end. Like I'm a woman, and ergo whatever is my interest is the end all be all of feminism. It's the same kind of like perverted logic that assumes that because Hillary Clinton be- would become president, that that would necessarily have the maximal effect of positivity for the feminist movement. By the same standard, Sarah Palin becoming president would have the same effect, you know, and it, and it can't work like that. Yeah. Carly Fiorina is not a woke thing. By no, any means. It's, it's hardly that. But that's like the ultimate, like, hypocrisy, which is that, like, you know, I think there was a, a funny one where there was a girl who like made this really big poster a couple of weeks ago, the Queen Brave Knack or something, and it was like a picture of all of the women. Very interestingly, only women who chose not to vote for Hillary Clinton, and it just said "fuck you" in front of all their faces. And she didn't put Susan Sarandon in it, so she made another one saying like, "I apologize, to Susan Sarandon." For forgetting to put your face in this, and she made one that was just all pictures of Susan Sarandon with "fuck you" across it. This woman has, you know, tens of thousands of followers. It gets out, it goes viral. Susan Sarandon sees it and quote tweets it, saying, uh, "You're welcome. It's fine. You know that you, you forgot to include me. Nothing, you know, mean. Nothing hurtful." As hurtful. gracious as possible in the situation. As gracious as possible, and then all of a sudden you hear the response. Oh my God! You know, fucking. Uh, Susan Sarandon is directing her hate mob at this proud woman. You know, like, what, what do you think this is? How do you think this works? Do you think this is just a bullhorn that you have and no one's allowed to respond to you? <laughs> it, it's really interesting because uh, I, I've seen over the course of, of, a, of about six months several times where you in particular have been called out for uh, directing your trolls. Uh, that's a term that I often see, is directing your trolls. And, and often, I, I, I would say that I've never been uh, privy to these DMs or, or mass messages or, you know, I'm still waiting for my uh, Antifa check, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And I think that one of the interesting things is, is that people are surprised in certain sectors that people might have interests or opinions about certain things that differ with theirs to the left. Yeah. It's very interesting. I mean, it's a question, you know, and again – this is something I'm comfortable talking about on here, but I don't want to, you know, it's, you don't want to melt down about it on Twitter being like, what do you people want from me? But, <laughs> but in reality, like, you know, people were telling me, I make a point, you know, I'll see people who are, you know, women who are a little bit fanatically too centrist or, you know, even men who are fanatically too centrist, but obviously you don't get called a sexist for dealing with them. Although sometimes people were called sexist for being mean to Peter Dow, so who knows? Um, but, you know, I make a point not to that. But best called, again... Massive Hollywood person, 150,000 followers, many more than me, um, and I politely replied. I didn't call her a bitch. I, I don't believe calling, like, anybody that, or, you know, I'll call you know, my cuck be that. But I don't believe in that type of discourse, especially <laughs> with women online. I didn't do anything. Yeah. I just yeah. politely pointed out, oh, and she also mocked me first. She called me bra. And so I said, oh, can you teach me how to be woke bra? Um, yeah. 
And, you know, cause, I mean, I am a dude, but she didn't know that. She's just, you know, doing that damn, dumb thing where she thinks everybody who disagrees with her is, you know, this whatever. So, you know, I reply, and then people, like, in, in very genuine form told me that it is unfair for me to reply to her because I have so many followers that it necessarily directs my, my followers towards her tweets. Um, and it, but it does not work in that in, case. In am reverse. I not allowed to interact with anybody on Twitter? Can I only make like, <laughs> if I can't make parody jokes about Antifa, if I can't make jokes or if I can't point out that people who are, you know, platforming George W. Bush are bad, what am I allowed to post about? Am I only this allowed is to, a, like, there's some, like, unspoken this is a very that, brave new world sort of idea of, of uh, Twitter discussion. It's like uh, alpha can only talk to an alpha. Beta can only talk to a beta, you know, exactly. Well, you know, it also feels kind of underhandedly very sexist in that they're like, if a woman has an opinion, you're not allowed to respond to that because she's too fragile to deal with like a response. You're like, <laughs> what? No. I mean, and that's not to say that, that, that that's distinct from a woman being harassed. Like if yeah. so, there are people who are harassed online, like Leslie Jones, when Milo directed harassment people at her, they were just sending her racist memes all the time. That's not any sort of productive yeah. dialogue. That's not anything, right? That's not even joking. That's just a bunch of people sending, you know, noose memes to a black woman. That's not funny. That's not productive. That's not interesting. Um, but if, if a, you know, if a powerful media person has, like, a, an edgy opinion that they know is edgy and then they are completely buffered from having it be responded to, like, what, what are we doing here? And, and also, it, it really is it's, uh, it's an opportunity for them to actually engage. And, and that's the thing is that if they, if they wanted to have an edgy – I mean, we've all had these discussions. If you want to have an edgy opinion about something you don't want people to react to, you call your friends. You don't put it on Twitter. Um, and, you know, that's, that's just the nature of, of how the media works. Yeah, I remember, like, at one point there was an intro- – oh, God, who was it? I'll remember later. Um, I just think like the most annoying part of it is all like always going to be the the echo chamberness or try to break into that echo chamber. You know, I think you have people like you know who are the you know torchbearers, shall we say, of like you know the centrist left or, or the centrist liberals. You know, uh, the Peter Dow, your uh, Candace Eastin, Al Giordano. These people online, these are kind of the torchbearers there. They will block you for liking the tweet at the wrong time. You know, they will yeah. block you for anything. Anything that could be. So Pan Deb, I saw that you liked a tweet from an account that had a fake Barrett. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, it's neurotic. <laughs> and then and then it lacks the self awareness to know maybe I shouldn't announce that I'm out like policing journalists uh, you know, on Twitter. Uh, it Can you imagine game. that how embarrassing that, that would be in any other circumstance? In any other world, if imagine you told if I, your friend, imagine if I like tweeted at fucking like history and flicks, being like, I can't believe, like publicly tweeted, like I can't believe you made fun of me on Twitter by liking a post that mildly made fun of me on someone else's feed that I don't follow. <laughs> like, oh god, what a beta move! Even looking yeah. up, not even posting about it, even looking that shit up. I don't even look at my mentions anymore from things that like people who aren't my friends, and I'm I'm such a prolific muter. Um, I don't block people because it gives them content. That's a Brandon Wardell uh, law. You should never block, only mute, because you should never give your enemies content. And, and blocking that's someone true. gives them content. That's, uh, that's, that's Brandon, excellent. That's not me. I can't take credit for that, that bit of wisdom. Um, but, you know, I, I'm a believer in it. Uh, so, you know, for the most part, I just, I don't, I don't see, you know, but I'm not blocking people who are like, you know, the best cause of the world. I'm blocking like, Pepe Keck 420 who just, you know, you know, tweets get in the gas chamber to every single tweet. Because that's stupid. Um, but, you know, people who want, I mean, even people on the right who want to have a dialogue, I'm never going to block them. I'm never going to ignore them. Uh, just because, like, I mean, what fucking value is your shit if, you know, you're not willing to stand by it? And then even more importantly, and this is something that I have to say, like, as a white man, it's easier for me to say this because, you know, harassment is, is different for for people like us, um, and that we don't really receive it. Uh, not the way that not nearly as much as everybody else, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, it's not, it's not 
And, you know, even if people wanted to come at me for being a white man, fine. It's Please, not a problem. Please, fine. Like, yeah, like, that's not <laughs> something that I should feel bad for. Uh, also, you're like, I, I get it. I get it. Like, I don't get victimhood status for that. And justify yeah, not it at all. No. Um, uh, you know, it was kind of like there was someone calling for conservative groups on campuses to be protected groups, and you're like, shut the fuck up. Like, it's not the point of what we're talking about. Not just because you're a small group that everybody hates. You have, yeah. People hate you because of what you say and do, not because of the color of your skin or your gender. Um, so, you know, that's a different thing. But, you know, for the most part, I found it just very easy to just not care. You know, you know? like someone says something mean to me online, unless it's like one of my favorite people who's like an author or a journalist I really respect, whatever, log off, you know? Like, you don't have to do this. Um, but uh, it is interesting how some people will take, you know, like, oh, I'm just going to post you on a beta, and then they get a little bit of pushback. And they're like, ah, how, how could you do this to me? <laughs> <laughs> when Thomas Pynchon trashes me online, that'll be upset. That's, exactly, that's yeah. It. Like, if fucking, I don't know, um, not even really anyone. <laughs> you know, I think another big problem. Actually, that would be the best day of my life if Thomas Pynchon even thought about me. Be, no, go ahead. If Thomas Pynchon even thought about me, that would be the best day of my life, I think. Yeah, that's yeah. great, even if he thought about you negatively. I feel the same way about Gore Vidal. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I think that, you know, at the end of the day, you just need to be able to, like, take a step back. I think it's also important. You know, I've only been on Twitter. I started posting as Krang around Christmas of last year, so it's only been about 10 months uh, that I was posting on it. Um, obviously a very eventful 10 months. Uh, getting up there into six-digit follows, but, uh, you know, whatever. Not that much loss. Um, but, uh, you know, as a result, like, I'm, I'm not an online guy. I was never, like, a forum guy. You know, I, I like Twitter and I like the news and stuff like that, but I'm not, you know, it's not my life, I guess. And so it's easier to just take a step back. But I think one of the biggest problems with the left in general lately is that we get very mad when, like, one of the people who's prominent in the left isn't perfect which is going to be a problem. Like, if you look at what happened with, like, the Chapo guys and their joke in L.A. or, you know, uh, anything, you know, kind of surrounding that, uh, you know, people getting drummed off for problematic tweets, you know, once in a while. You know, it's the same thing with politicians. Bernie's never going to be perfect. Even Corbin's never going to be perfect. As much yeah. as I love the man, he's never going to be perfect. He's always going to have things that are going to make you not – the little things that you don't like. And if the rule is now – if someone is that bad, I mean, if someone does one little thing wrong, then they're not going to be, you know, good. Then, you know, what the fuck is, you know, what's, what's the end game there? Because, um, I mean, say what you will about the right. They have solidarity like a motherfucker. They have already allowed Milo back into their ranks after he unabashedly announced that he was a pedophile. You know, I, I think you make a great point there. I think that we could all be a little gentler on each other and understand that, that, you know, take people out as, as, as their totality. And yeah. um, though sometimes, you know, there are things that, you know, cross the line that we have to address. But give people I think space. reasonable people can make that yeah. distinction, though. You know? Yeah, give people space to, to, to grow, uh, yeah. especially given, you know, that people are young. I was like, I'm leaving Twitter for a while. I was like, really? Like, no one said it. I, I, mean, I looked yeah. through all the mentions. No one said anything like, personally hurtful about her they didn't like comment on her appearance and anything. all it was was just like it's bad that you platform george w bush that's all they said and you know so at the same time i think you know people need to take online less seriously like oh a bunch of people yeah. say you need george w bush just don't just say you know what i shouldn't have platform george w bush and tweet tomorrow um but instead she decided to say that bernie supporters are worse than nazis and that she's quitting twitter you know, I, I think that a lot of that comes down to sort of uh, opportunity as class. Um, a lot of people have a lot of opportunities at a, lot, at a younger age and haven't had a lot of the pushback or the, the sort of struggle that a lot of other people have had. And when they run into any sort of these, these roadblocks, just like the white mm. guys who are in, you know, Charlottesville or wherever, where, when equality feels like – when equality occurs, it feels like oppression sometimes. Uh, and, you know, I think that we're going to see more and more of that come out because we're interacting with the people who had 
more opportunity than us, and more and more. Uh, and you're mm-hmm. seeing people from different classes. You're seeing kids who live half on the street but are in a DSA chapter interact with people who had an internship in high school with a, with a, with a senator, you know. Yeah, and it's interesting that the people who had the internship in high school with the senator tend to be a lot more uh, fragile, I've noticed. <laughs> it is interesting, and, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, if you talk to, like, you know, one of my good friends, Lana Del Raytheon online, um, you know, queer socialist, biracial, um, you know, has the, the thickest skin about anything. Um, and I've actually seen other people getting mad on their behalf and, and they have to step in and be like, this isn't something you should get mad about. Stop. <laughs> like, yeah. like white people getting mad for them. And he's like, they're like, you know, this isn't, uh, you know, anything you should, you should be worried about. Um, yeah. And, you know, that's not to say, again, that's not to say that there aren't very real instances of targeted harassment, of racism, of sexism. They're, they're rampant. But I think it takes a lot away from it. Like, it actually kind of actively hurts the movement when the kind of overly sensitive people uh, decide that this is going to be their moment to, you know, uh, you know, stand on their ground about, you know, the joke that, you know, come town made or something like that. Well, that's yeah. also been an it's, interesting little thing, and I know we're probably coming to the end here, but I have noticed yeah. this is something that's, and I don't have any answer for this, but it's just been an interesting thing I've noticed in the last couple of weeks, has been that there seems to be a sincere divide between weird left Twitter and left left Twitter and, like, the comedian left Twitter, which is that, you know, when Trump was elected, you got a lot of comedians, like, to come down set, you know, people peripheral to them. Uh, you know, most of weird Twitter kind of came out as like, oh, these people actually have pretty sincere left leanings. But, you know, when we were under this kind of neoliberal malaise of, of the last, you know, couple of decades, it didn't really, uh, you know, purify into something that they would talk about online. And you have people like, I mean, History and Flicks used to be an actual account about historical photos. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's, that was what it was. And then, you know, politics happened. So yeah, you have yeah. a lot of people coming out of the woodwork who are comedians first and foremost, but then have left sympathies. And yeah. then you have left activists who are a little bit older and have a little bit more kind of, um, you know, I think uh, world uh, weariness and, and a little bit more experience and, and wisdom about it. And they tend not to get a little bit worked up. So, you know, you look at people like Sean McElwee and other people who are very focused on things that matter. Like Sean, you know, is very focused on, you know, his work with, you know, abolishing ice and, you know, uh, you know, a host of other policy issues that are really important. And he exists in this world, but doesn't tend to get upset by, you know, the comedian side. And then you'll have the other people who, you know, once every, you know, three months find out who Nick Mullen is and get, get very, very <laughs> mad. Um, the funny thing is Nick hasn't tweeted in almost a year. And I think in that last year, he's not he extremely was, online he anymore. anymore. <laughs> He's not online anymore at all. And I, I think there have been three separate huge waves of, like, college activists finding out who he was, finding old tweets of his, and, like, being like, anybody who follows this person is an immediate unfollow. They had some huge campaign about that where they were going to, like, unfollow anybody who followed Nick Mullen. And you're like, again, how are we supposed to build any sort of coalition this way? <laughs> yeah, that's the question. So just to yeah. send, uh, send everybody off with a, with a really positive note, what is the Tao of Krang? The Tao of Krang? Yeah. Um, I'm assuming you're asking, like, what's kind of the, the background of it? Yeah. 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 Um, this is funny, man. I think I mentioned this on Rakaya's podcast, but, like, everybody was asking me what it was, Krang T. Nelson. They were like, oh, man, this is a guy who's, like, a huge fan of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and the, like, 1970s sitcom Coach, which starred Craig T. Nelson. Um, to be honest, I'm not a huge fan of either. I was, like, a big Teenage Mutant, Nerd, like, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles fan in, like, the early 90s at the correct age to be, to be that, uh, I guess, in, in American culture. And I have never seen anything with Craig T. Nelson in it. It was a, a pun name from a trivia team I had a couple years ago. Um, and I made a Twitter account that I never used uh, with that name. And then when I decided to start posting, I just hopped on it and started posting. Um, so uh, that's what happened. My new account uh, currently, is, unless I get 86 again, knock on wood, is, uh, is Fraser T. Krang. I wanted it to be Fraser Krang, but someone else had it. 
And I will say that I am, and anybody who knows me from online, an enormous Frasier fan. So if you want to get in good with me, Frasier references are the way to go. Absolutely. And I, I'd love to have you back on to talk more Frasier, actually. Uh, I think oh, there's – I think Frasier – I have Rich Jensen is a, is a good friend. He's a, was involved in Sub Pop Records and uh, is a sort of a, a – understanding of the Seattle gentrification scene and pop and yeah. culture. And I would love to get the three of us to talk about moment. gentrification, music, Frasier, and Seattle. Yeah. I know a little bit about Seattle. I don't know very much about the gentrification going on there. I love the city, um, but I know a shit ton about Frasier. So <laughs> anything you want to talk to me about Frasier, I, I, I'm yep. an encyclopedic. There's a working there's workings of a book or an article there for sure. Well, thank Absolutely. you so much for coming on, and uh, it's been a real pleasure. Um, I'm sure that you'll be back up to your original Twitter numbers, and also if we learned anything about uh, about the kids, is that if you're slightly forbidden, then you're uh, you're desirable. So you're probably going to have more followers than you had yesterday. Uh, yeah, so I'm dangerous once now. We, <laughs> yes, exactly. So once again, that's Frazier T. Krang, formerly yeah, uh, Krang T. Krang. T. Nelson. So, all right, thank yeah. you so much. Okay. All right, and we're going to end this interview yeah. now. Hey.